Okay, guys, let's get going. So tell me if you guys can't. Tell me if you guys cannot hear me. Okay, everybody's good. Okay, great. So, uh, so awesome. So our, our our wetland characterization. So again, our charge here is that you guys are um, you're at the consulting firm, and your boss said, "Yo, uh, there's this this RFP, this request request for proposals, and uh, and the city of Carpinteria wants to do something in the in the marsh here. So wants to do some restoration. So your boss said, "Hey." you whoever you are or your team i want a quick uh, summary of the conditions right and i want to know maybe what we might want to do so again the write-up that you're going to be doing which you can be doing next week with your group one per group is um man it's really hot in my pirate coat right now <laughs> Woo! Yeah. very hot costume um so uh anyway um the 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 charge is for you to both do the the overall characterization which we've done before but now to also do what we might do, propose, which you might do for the restoration, right? So that part we've not done yet. Again, it's a different group. It, we're, we're, we, we shifted groups a bit. So, so uh, based on who could come and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, you guys do have a new group. So make sure you reach out to those folks if you haven't already by today. Hopefully you guys are taking some good pictures and or short, you know, 15, 20, 30 second video clips or whatever. So you could plug those into your minute to four minute video. Um, uh yeah and so so uh i'll be doing some of that so if you guys if your camera dies or something we'll have at least a few things you can draw on and you're welcome to use those as well but hopefully you guys are getting your own your, your own things that you think are you wanted to highlight or what have you okay um and uh and then the last one i just want to say logistically is uh we have a, a brief quiz that's due today at five just five quick questions if you guys watch the videos if you guys are on this tour it should be simple but just to sort of make sure people are paying attention and actually understanding what's going on. Cool? Okay. Um, and then, uh, and I mentioned before, I've mentioned those guys also, but uh, so next week's, one of next week's activities is to show that you guys voted. And so you can do that however, I don't want to see what you voted, but I just want to see evidence that you guys participated in the process. So uh, if you guys, uh, you know, picture your ballot or you got it mailed to you, or if you're going to go do that, whatever, just most generous definition of what that means but some documentation that you guys were participating in the process don't care who you vote for i kind of do but 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 more important is you guys should participate right so young folks on average have very low participation rates and i think it's important that you all express your opinions and partic participate in our like electoral process so okay um enough said all right so let's let's talk about ash avenue woohoo so let me first just make sure we're all on the same page. And you guys also, get, we're, a, we're a smaller group than last week, so you guys can totally interrupt me about whatever. Okay. So we're going to do it just like last time. If you guys weren't able to come to our previous field trip, we're going to sit here and talk. I'm recording this, so we'll have all this memorialized for the students that can't be here in person. So I'll record, put these all up. So we're going to talk here for a bit, go to another site, hit record over there, talk about another aspect, another aspect, and we're going to slowly walk around the perimeter of this site. That's what we're doing today. Cool, and you guys are welcome to take photos anytime, interrupt anytime, ask, what have you. Okay, so um, with that said, let's get let's get going. So Ash Avenue, this is part of the salt, the Carpinteria Salt Marsh uh, system. This system was, as with most of these systems, a large alluvial plain, a large coastal plain where the freshwater source would meander back and forth and deposit sediments and and fresh water over the course of the the year. Um, in this case, we have two uh, main hydrological inputs, Franklin K Creek and Santa Monica Creek. The first one, Franklin Creek, is right here. So if we look right across the marsh, we'll see this sort of elevated berm. That elevated berm is, is, is our side of the channel of Franklin Creek, right? There's another one on the opposite side. Now, this, this high berm, that is not natural. That was put in by flood control folks in the 50s because they are worried that the floodwaters were flooding the town. So they've constrained uh, both these systems, but we've constrained the hydrological flow to where we wanted it to go, right? So it can't just go willy-nilly wherever. Key problem throughout the world by doing this, right? Again, if we have a little house right here and we put a little berm around our house, no problem. But when we start channelizing the entirety of these waterways, in some cases we do that by putting hard structures on the bottom, some cases we do that by putting elevated sides on the on the channels however we do it it changes the hydrology 
Uh, my friends in Louisiana today, they're just texting me pictures of what Hurricane Zeta did, the fifth named hurricane to make landfall in Louisiana. A historical, uh, we've never had more than that hit. So this is, this is crazy times. One of the reasons they're so vulnerable is their salt marshes have been eroding, disappearing. Why? Because of this same exact phenomenon. So we've levied the Mississippi. So the sediment, that not only did the water come out and flood people's houses, but it also brought sediment, right, with that flooding. And that deposition of sediment met, that meant that the salt marsh was able to stay here. I'll explain that in a second, in case you guys, that doesn't make sense. But question? Uh, where's the other river? Sorry, this is Franklin. The other one is Santa Monica. Okay. So both of them came and they just came down. And if you take your hand, and so you've all heard the term tributaries, right? Tributaries. So, so, so if I put my hand up and, and my wrist is where we're talking about, the tributaries would be all the fingers of channels feeding into, feeding into my, my arms, right? So the same exact thing happens if we just flip our hands down. Instead of calling them tributaries, we can call them distributaries, right? So where it takes that water, that energy, that material, and instead of concentrating it, it disperses it. And that's what these coastal salt marshes did, right? So they had this big river say, or creek or whatever coming out of the mountains, very contained, you know, boom, 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 roiling water, hits here, this flat area, and it slows down. Slo jumps, and when it's flooding, it jumps the tidal creek, jumps out, and as soon as it jumps out, it slows down. It doesn't go as fast because it's not tumbling and boiling and rumbling and all that kind of stuff. As it, as, it, as it smooths out, it can't hold, because it's not as turbulent, it can't hold as much sediment. So as it starts to slow down, spread out over the marsh plain, it drops that sediment. Well, why do we care about that? Because we have huge amounts of organic matter in all of, our, all of these wetland systems. Any wetland system we talk about in the world, okay? But particularly in a place like this, we have a lot of um, you know, plants, very dense vegetation, etc. There's all these plants in the air, there's also all these roots and stems and things in the ground. So that means there's a lot of organic matter, there's a lot of carbon, there's a lot of tissue material inside the soil. In addition, every time we, we flood and we bring stuff down out of the mountains, it's bringing more branches and, and leaves and all that other organic stuff, right? And that hangs out here. And just like everything else, when the floodwaters recede, that stuff gets left here. So as a consequence, we have a lot of organic material incorporated into our wetland soils, okay? So they're in the wetland soils, all good. Because we have a lot of water here, because they tend to be anoxic, because there tends to be, they tend to be waterlogged, right? Remember that when we talked about our different parts of our wetlands? Because they tend to be waterlogged, that means that the degradation of that or organic material is very slow. It's not like if, like up here, up, up on the terrestrial area, if we dug a, dug a hole and threw some leaves in and put some dirt on it, those leaves would break down pretty quickly, right? Out here, it can take a lot longer. So as a consequence, our wetland soils are almost always heavily enriched with organic matter. So that means that, that uh, a lot of the volume of the soil, a lot of the volume of the stuff underground is dead stuff, okay? So, and, and, and so, as things break down, that dead stuff goes away, the volume goes away. So without this constant addition of sediment and other organic material, the wetland tends to shrink. It tends to go down. The term we use is subsidence, right? It's subside, the, the, the top of the soil goes lower. So as we cut off regular inundation from these wetland systems, the salt marsh plain starts to get lower and lower. And it's a, it's a feedback loop, right? As it gets lower and lower, then it's gonna have even less plant material and less biomass, and it's gonna, you know, and it's kind of, then it subs you know, sub subsides faster and faster and faster. Yeah? Would it be a negative feedback loop or a positive? Uh, well, it's a great question. If you're talking about preservation of the marsh, a negative one. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Just to clarify, this is because we have tributaries, not distributaries. Because distributaries would be natural, which would be healthy. Right, right. So, yeah, so to be clear, what I'm talking about is, 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 so the natural, the natural system is a lot of distributaries, lots of water spilling over either daily or seasonally, depending on what the, how the hydrology works, but lots of water spilling over. With that water comes everything else that's in the water, sediment, organics, etc. As we put in channels, like this one we see on Franklin Creek, we sever that tie. 
And because we severed that tie, we can't add the, the sediment as fast as it tends to go away. So, so uh, and, and, and this isn't an extreme example because we, we have connectivity with the sea, but in many of our systems up and down the coast, we have complete cessation of hydrological connectivity. And that's a huge problem. So, so what does this mean? We have some areas in the San Francisco, remember I showed that picture in class of the, of Elkhorn Slough, right? And, and the folks did the great, they, they, they levied it off and they started grazing it. And you're like, what the F? Why are there cows in the salt marsh? Because there isn't any salt water coming in. That land doing nothing else, doing nothing else, just cutting off the water, the land will start to lower and lower and lower. What does that mean? We have some areas in the San Francisco Bay area 30, 32 feet down lower. So not just, we're not talking an inch or two, we're talking potentially massive differences. When we add in things like sea level rise, one, a little, there's just some natural sea level rise going on, but most of it is human driven thanks to climate change. So we're shoving the water up higher. The land tends to be getting lower. We could fight off a huge amount, a huge amount, of our, sea, of, of our coastal land loss if we, if we took out these flood control channels. Why? Because that natural sediment would be coming in and would be counteracting, maybe not 100%, but at least a lot of that elevational loss, right? But because we put in these permanent structures, apartments, houses, power plants, we're like, no, 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 we can't have any water come in, so it makes it more complicated, okay? But just so we're on the same page, that's that, that levee around Franklin Creek that was added by the flood control, control district. So this, if we came here, oh, I don't know, 75 years ago or so, you wouldn't see, you would be able to look straight across all the way to the 101 kind of kind of deal, right? A big flat plane. Cool? So one other one I'll just say, just because we're on the topic here, and then we'll, we'll switch to something else. Um, our, our, our healthy, intact tidal creeks, I tried to show this in one of the videos I made beforehand, but I don't know if I did a good job. I think I was... Didn't do a good job. Anyway, so um, when we talk about our tidal creeks right here, if we look right here, the tide is high, we can see this tidal channel, yeah? The, the, the water has flooded it, and we're seeing the standing water, like the gap between the, the plants, right? If the water is lowered, if you look at those videos I made uh, this last weekend, it was low tide, and so you'll see that there's, there was mud flat, not, not, not a lot of water in here. What we'll see is we'll see gentle channels, gentle mud flat channels, boom, like a gentle V, shallow V, and then there'll be a deeper, uh, like almost like, like we made a, 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 a cake, frosted cake, and then we kind of cut into the cake, right? And so that deeper cut, the thalweg, the deepest part of the channel, that's the one that routinely gets, gets water. Any, pretty much any reasonable tide, there'll be water in there. The rest of the channel doesn't necessarily, of the mud flat part, doesn't necessarily get covered unless it's a, a really high tide, right? But, but what, we, what we tend to think, you and I, or oh, let me say that again. When I started working in wetlands, because I was not very smart, I come out and look at this and I say, ah, this is a healthy tidal channel right here. And, and relatively speaking, this is a fine. I'm not saying this is horrible by any means, right? So here we go. But check it out. It's plants, 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 and then it dips down into the muddy creek sides, yeah? really old, really mature tidal channels, it goes like this. So instead of going like this, flat, 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 uh, uh, down deep, it goes flat, 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 lump, then down. So there's a natural levee. It's not as big as that levee, but you know, we're talking six inches, a foot, two feet, something like that. Levees are natural processes. Levees aren't human created. Humans can create levees, but levees will build up over time in any kind of riverine system. For the same for the same reason as the as the water gets kind of high and has those sediments it, it, it gets deposited there right and so when we have these big floods that's when it completely jumps out of the channel so uh the reason i mentioned that is because the natural flooding of wetlands when i started working these salt marshes i assumed here's the ocean here's the land i assume that when the tide starts going up these areas get flooded first right if the water starts coming up the, the tidal channels first because those are the lowest areas. Water's coming up, water's coming up, water's coming up. And then it just, and so these areas on this part of the marsh get flooded first. These areas get flooded last. Turns out I was completely wrong. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. So in most of these systems where I was working, like, like Ash Avenue, like Carpinteria here, these are degraded. These are, these are systems that have gotten, you know, whumped on a lot by our society. 
if we go to some of these older sections, so some of the far sections of Carpinteria over there, some of the older contiguous sections of Magoo Lagoon, uh, China Camp up in San Francisco Bay Area, the, these sort of older chunks that for whatever reason have mostly not been tweaked by people, what you'll find is as the tide comes up, the back floods first. Because, because, because we have these levees on the main part of the channel. So instead of flooding uh, ocean to land, they tend to flood land to ocean. Um, so what does that mean? That, does, it mean? does it mean a huge amount for us in the restoration design? I suppose not. But in terms of the distribution of critters, right, um, you might think initially, oh, we'll put the birds' nests back here, right, the place where the birds can find their nest in the back of the marsh, that'd be the most protected, right? That, that's not necessarily the best plan, right? We want their nests on the highest elevation, but that highest elevation isn't necessarily the back. So, so in other words, hydrology can be complex. Hydrology has been messed with here. So we've put in these, these, this channelization of the water coming in. Also in the 50s, we started having some problems where the mouth was beginning to silt in, the connection with the ocean. And so one of the first things that the flood control districts folks did was come in and, and, and open up that mouth. Now the mouth is permanently fixed open. We've talked about some places like Malibu that we visited. In theory, the mouth can breach here, it can breach there. Santa Clara River can breach here, it can breach there, etc. Here it's fixed open. So it, it is never closed anymore and it can never move anymore. We have all these houses here. These homeowners would not like it if it migrated onto their property, right? Um, and, then, uh, and then more recently, so we did this Ave, Ash Avenue restoration 97, the basin, the, what's called the basin one restoration, the next chunk over there, that was done in the early 2000s. And then since then, the flood control district has come and done a little bit of digging out of the sill of the mouth. It was getting a little bit restricted. It wasn't filled in, but it was, it was restricting the so-called tidal prism the, and, and not letting as much water as could be exchanged every tidal cycle. Um, do that. So, so, so those are the tweaks. So right now, the only major tweaks that have been done, the only major restoration efforts that have been done is here where we're standing, Ash Avenue. We're going to walk in a second and start talking about what we did. And then the, the next basin over, a little bit of modification. That's basically it. So we, this is not a site that's been a lot of aggressive years of, years of manipulation. This is more of a site that's sort of set aside and, and trying to sort of preserve it, per se. So there's lots of possibilities of things we could do in terms of a restoration. Cool? Uh, let's see, the other, only other introductory thing I'll say is that the land use here, the land ownership here is complicated. So whereas Malibu, state park, uh, Santa Clara River mouth, state park, Magoo Lagoon, military base, right? There's, you know, mostly we're talking one owner or maybe one or two or so owners. Here it's much more complex. So over there, over on the main chunk, Basin three on the map that I put on the website, but, but basically the, the, the chunk closest or, or most westward, most intact, most healthiest part, that was purchased by the University of California in 1977 to add to the reserve. So there's, one of the, there's three folks that helped found the University of California Natural Reserve System, one of which is named Kenneth uh, S. Norris. Um, we actually have a reserve name for him, which I was hoping to take my coastal class to, and they just told me this week that we can't go there, which is a pisser. Um, anyway, uh, uh, so Kenneth S. Norris profiled this area and said in the late 60s, hey, this is really valuable, we should save this. And so after 10 years of lobbying, et cetera, he convinced the University of California to purchase this. But there are, there's a whole matrix of other owners of this place. The city of Carpinteria owns some of it, uh, the Trust for Lands of Santa Barbara County or the Santa Barbara Trust for Lands. I'm not saying that right. It's the Land Trust of Santa Barbara, I think is what it is. Um, owns, owns a good chunk of it, Basin 1. Uh, and then a lot of these homeowners sold some of the... So the ownership, the parcels went kind of from the ocean inland. And so a lot of those, the inner parcel or the inner reaches, they sold to the University of California. At least some of them did but there are still other homeowners leases that exist here. So they, they control small amounts. So there's, there's many owners of this. And so uh, that, doesn't mean, that doesn't mean nothing can happen, but it just makes it a bit more complicated. We have to make sure we really do talk to, we should be talking to everybody anyway, but, but not only do we wanna to talk to you and get you involved, but if you control the land, you legally need to say, it's okay for me to put my tractor on here or, or, or whatever, yeah? Okay, cool. Other questions about the general setting, the general context of this Ash Avenue site or Carpinteria. 
you say that there's a basin behind this levee? Yeah, so, so, so there's, there's, we really have a... Yeah. So it works around that way? Yeah, so, so four different regions of this marsh. There's nothing magic about it. It's just, it's just practically speaking so we can name it. There's nothing magic about where the names came from. This region where we are, we call the Ash Avenue section, which is where you're standing. All the stuff that we see here, what we talk about today, the restoration over to the levee, the Franklin Creek levee, Ash Avenue area. Then on the other side, uh, on that immediate chunk right there, we call that Basin 1. Uh, and then from Basin 1 to the, to the oil and gas road, which is now the, the entrance road for the, for the development over here, uh, that's Basin 2. And then on the other side, which is the core of the healthy marsh, et cetera, the, the Carpinteria Reserve, et cetera, that one is Basin 3, right? Again, there's nothing scientific about those names. It's just some arbitrary ways that we can talk about. So Ash Avenue, Basin 1, Basin 2, Basin 3. So as we go more that way, as we go towards Basin 3, that's the healthiest, most intact marsh. For our restorations here, that's the local reference site, right? We could say it that way if we wanted to. Good. Other, other questions or other general questions about the site setting here before we start walking? How's the water getting over there? How's the water getting over? On the other side. Oh, so just to be to clear. The other basin. So just to be clear, there's, in this whole system, there's the water coming down from up top, Franklin Creek, uh, Santa Monica Creek. Right. There's also connectivity from the ocean mouth. Okay. So there's, and so, so there's tidal creeks that go into all these areas. So this, we are not severed from the ocean right here in Ash Avenue. So here, let's imagine we're some, we're a rubber ducky. Someone dropped in the, the Franklin Creek, let's say. Starts up in the mountains, comes on down, comes on down. Boom, goes here, goes through, goes underneath the 101 and through some pipes and stuff. Comes out. Now we're on the other side of that levee it's going down there it goes all the way down a bit farther over there kind of towards the flagpole a little bit past the flagpole and then it's going to go and then it's going to start to go into the main channel to go out to the ocean ah tidal tidal change tide goes slack it's kind of the rubber duck is like what dude and it's a little windy or something the wind's blowing this way he gets in a tidal channel near the mouth and he gets blown up here so that's how the rubber ducky can get here so this so, so these, all these sections are theoretically connected to each other. Not theoretically, they are connected to each other. But, but we're, we're sort of off to the side here. So probabilistically, we don't get as much of the, kind of, uh, you know, of the rubber duckies as we would have compared if we were in the main basin or something. The other thing I'll say about that, just to complete that story, is we do have a lot of urban drool, right? So we do have a lot of people watering their lawns, a lot of this and that. So we have er storm drains that also feed into Ash Avenue here and other areas. But that's, that's, that's not unimportant, but that's a small fraction compared to the water coming in from the creeks every, every year. Other general context setting questions to this place? Okay, so let, let, let's, keep, uh, let's keep walking. Ugh.